Hey guys! Today I'm going to review from Russia with Love. Your trap, Mr. Bond. You cannot escape. From Russia with Love came out in 1963 and is the second Bond film. It is also the second of three films directed by Terence Young. Terence Young made some of the more realistic Bond films from Dr. No, from Russia We Love, and Thunderball. It's based on the Ian Fleming novel from 1957, which was the fifth in the series of books. John F. Kennedy named the novel among his top ten favourite books of all time in Life magazine. This created a buzz for the title, thus the film was made. The film was edited by Peter Hunt, who would later direct On a Majesty's Secret Service. Music was by John Barry. The film runs 115 minutes. It cost two million to make. This was double the budget of Dr. Noor. However, it made 79 million back, which was a massive success and established the series of films. It also won a BAFTA award for best cinematography. A video game of the film came out in 2005 with Sean Connery once again voicing the character of Bond. Ken Adams was unavailable to do the sets for the film, as he was working on Doctor Strange Love. However, most of the cast from the first film reappear. It's also the first appearance of Desmond Llewellyn as Q, and features the first pre-title sequence. Matt Monroe sung the title song, which would be used at the end of the film, not the beginning. From Russia We Love is regarded as a classic among the Bond fans, and many vote it as the best Bond film ever made. The film stars Sean Connery, Daniela Bianchi, Robert Shaw, Lottie Lenya, Pedro Armaderes, Bernard Lee, Lewis Maxwell and Desmond Llewellyn. So the plot of this one's about Spectre wanting revenge on James Bond for killing Dr. Noor in the first film. James Bond searches for the Lecter device that has the potential to wreak havoc in the world and stop Spectre, a secret crime organisation, from acquiring it. So this is very much a sequel from the first film. Blofeld pops up for the first time and he actually mentions Dr. Noor from the first film. And I quite like this Blofeld because he don't properly say his face, just his body. And this type of disembodied Blofeld appears in Thunderball. And it's quite effective, it's very sinister. Not saying his face, it's as though if you say his face he, he just becomes ordinary. But because he don't say his face, it gives them this more sinister appeal. I like how Sylvia Trench from the first film pops up again at the, the beginning of this film where she's with Bond. However, this would be the last time you'd see her. And she actually mentions that last time Bond had to go away to Jamaica. Another reference to the first film. So it's good continuity in the first film Doctor No was only made a year before this. So there was only a one year gap. Unlike films that you get these days where it's well over three years between films, if not longer. Another strange thing is this film, The Butchered. It's only double from Dr. Noor. Dr. Noor was a million, this is two million. But it looks so much bigger and epic. And the Blu-ray looks stunning. Blu-rays really emphasise how colourful these films in the 60s were. So the pre-title sequence this was the first time it was used and it's very effective. You say this man who has a, a Sean Connery mask on, it's not really Sean Connery, although it was played by Sean Connery, and he gets murdered by Red Grant at the beginning of the film. And this makes the audience feel as though Bond could get killed in the film. It, it's sort of like a, a message that's put into the audience's heads that Bond isn't really a superhero, he's just an ordinary man who can get killed. And this is also used later in the film when Red Grant is watching the character of Bond and he saves him at the gypsy camp by shooting this assassin who's going to kill him because he's wanting Bond alive, because he's wanting the Lecter device. So the audience think that Bond's lucky to be alive to get so far. So it really emphasises that Bond's just an ordinary guy. 
And I think that's really good. That's very unusual for a Bond film. So you almost feel as though Bond's got lucky so far to be alive. You get onto the title sequence and it's not one of the best actually. It looks too dark. And the Matt Monroe from Russia We Love song's not used. It's instrumental. It's not one of the best title sequences. It's just words over a belly dancer. It's hard to make out as well. After that you get introduced to all the villains in the film and this is very much a film based on characters. It's a character driven film. After you get introduced to Blofeld, which is quite an effective scene because you see these fighting fish in a tank. You see Rosa Klebb, very uh, sinister looking woman. A real labour of love. Hey Phil, she's a bloody muff muncher. Policeman, you can't see that. You have to use the correct pronoun. Lesies, lesbians. <laughs> then there's Kronstein, who's the planner, and he's a chess champion as well. And of course, you see Red Grant, he gets introduced, where Rosa Klebb actually uses a knuckle duster on him, punches him in the stomach to see how tough he is. Yeah, hell, she's a nasty bloody cow hitting him. If I was him, I'd flap the bloody bitch. Hey, that's that bugger out the jaws. Yes, Bones, he was in Jaws. He played the character of Quint. So it's 18 minutes into the film before you say James Bond properly, Sean Connery. And he's much more confident in the part as well. This is one of his best performances, actually, and it's only his second film. All the regulars are in the film. There's a good scene with them in his office where... He introduces the character of Q, Desmond Llewellyn. Although he's not in much, it's a good scene. And he also shows Bond the briefcase, which is one of the best gadgets in the series. There's so much packed into this suitcase. Money Penny looks really young and she's very flirty in this film with Bond. However, I think one of the best characters in the films, Karen Beer played by Pedro Amadares, and he was actually dying during the making of the film. This would be his last film and he, he just managed to finish the film before passing away. Brilliant performance though, and the chemistry between him and Bond, it's a, it's a proper friendship. And it is actually better than the character of Felix Leiter who's in other films in the series. You do get a feeling that they properly like each other. And his death sequence later on in the film is really touching. You say Bond and he finds he's died in the carriage in the tree And there's a, a really good subtle performance by Connery where he, he touches his shoulder like that. And afterwards he's full of hell. He, he, he slaps the Bond girl around because he, he doesn't trust her. And he's very serious throughout the film from then on. So uh, I thought that was really clever, really good performance. And speaking of the Bond girl, Tatiana, she's one of the, the best of the Connery Bonds. That's probably one of the weakest part of the Connery era, that there wasn't a very good relationship with Bond and the Bond girl. So for once, the Connery Bonds kind of like in a romantic relationship with the Bond girl. I think one of the few power points of the films that Ken Adams wasn't available. He was doing Doctor Strange Love. So there was no massive Bond sets that you usually get. However, I don't think this film really needed it. Because this film's probably one of the most realistic of the Bond films. It's very much a spy thriller. And it's probably the most authentic Ian Fleming novel put to screen. Then you get on to the brilliant train sequence. That's probably the highlight of any Bond film. So you see him getting introduced to Red Grant, who has a British accent. That, that's like a big surprise. You expect him to be this stereotypical Russian assassin. <laughs> but he's got this British accent. That, that's a good touch. Later he drugs the Bond girl. So he's got Bond in the carriage on his own and he, he's threatening him with this gun. Brilliant scene. Robert Shaw's excellent. You see the headlines? British agent murders beautiful Russian spy and then commits suicide. Tell me, which lunatic asylum did they get you out of? Don't make it tougher on yourself. In the threats he, he gives Bond, you actually think he's really psychotic. He's wanting Bond to kiss his feet. Really tense scene. Very uh, Alfred Hitchcock type of suspense. 
first one won't kill you. Not the second. Not even the third. Not till you crawl over here and you kiss my foot. And it turns out that Red Grant's only weakness is greed. Because Bond makes him open his briefcase saying he's got gold sovereigns in. And it, all, it contains Q's gas canister that blows in his face. And then you get the brilliant fight sequence between Bond and Red Grant. And these two big guys are really going at it. And it's really brutal. And Peter Hunt did a brilliant editing job on this. I, I like his jump cuts. Sometimes it gets criticised, jump cuts, but Peter Hunt is the best at doing jump cuts for action sequences. And I think his jump cuts look brilliant. It really makes it fast moving and unnerving. So after the train fight, I've always classed this film as it reaching its climax too early. Because after the train fight, you can't really top it. So everything after it is a bit of an anti-climax. And in some ways that's true. But watching it this time, I, I still like the scenes after the train fight. They're still pretty impressive. You get a helicopter chase that's really good. You actually see the helicopter almost hit the stunt guy. Really uh, well shot. And of course the boat chase where Bond sets fire to all these spectre speedboats that are chasing after him. It's a great fiery climax. You, you see the stuntmen in flames it looks really impressive and of course rosa Klebb, right at the end of the film tries to attack bond with a, a dagger in a show a poisonous blade so overall i thought this was a classic it's a, a unique film and it, it's very much set in the real world unlike others in the series even dr noah that that had uh, moments of unbelievability but this one you could actually imagine it all happening all the way through there's nothing too far-fetched about it and it's more character driven as well it's very much like a like if alfred hitchcock had directed a, a proper bond film this would be what would turn out so overall i'd give this one top marks 10 10 out of 10 but i do think bones are doing like it I thought it was an excellent film, Phil. Top marks. Okay, everybody, bye. Like, subscribe, and share. Bye. Bye. <sighs> that pays many debts. She should have kept her mouth shut.